The image a lot of us have of John F. Kennedy is that he sailed boats off the coast of Cape Cod, off of Hyannis, and he was from Massachusetts. But one thing is that he uh, actually spent a lot of his childhood growing up in the New York area. And I want to go through and show you the various candidates for the presidency and those who were elected to office who were from New York and where they lived in New York and also talk about trends in U.S. electoral history going back to the mid to late 1800s. Now here I've put pictures of all the presidents from Lincoln on through President Trump and I don't show the first 15 presidents from George Washington up to Buchanan but starting from Lincoln to Trump that's a total of 28 presidents and I will just tick them off left to right top to bottom and the ones I've outlined in red are the ones that lived in New York before they became president. So we have Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, Ulysses S. Grant, James Garfield, Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland, Rutherford B. Hayes, that's a top row, then William McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, Woodrow Wilson, Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, that's the second row, and then Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Richard Nixon, and Gerald Ford, it's the third row, and the bottom row, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr., Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. And I'm also going to talk about some of the New Yorkers that ran for president that didn't win but and are not exactly household names, except if you're from New York. I know when I used to talk to my parents about politics, they would bring up some of these guys' names like, oh, Al Smith, yeah, Al Smith, and Wendell Wilkie, they remembered, and Thomas Dewey. But these are the presidents going back to when they first started tabulating the popular vote and so they were, in several cases, they were former governors of New York. And in other cases, they were other things other than lawyers. But these candidates, many of whom came close to winning, some of them who did not come close, but they include Samuel Tilden, Charles Evans Hughes, Al Smith, Thomas Dewey. And then in the bottom row, Horace Greeley was a newspaper editor of a nationally syndicated newspaper. Winfield Scott Hancock was a general for the U.S. Army and served in the Civil War, including at Gettysburg. And William Cullen Bryan is the only one I've not outlined in red who is not from New York, but I just thought he looked like an interesting guy that I want to learn more about. He ran for president three times in the late 18 and early 1900s. And then Wendell Wilkie, was another New Yorker who was a lawyer and ran for the presidency. So this almost looks like a barcode symbol that looks totally random, but what this chart shows just basically when the Republicans won and then when the Democrats won. So you can see over time, going back to 1872, that it's been back and forth, back and forth pretty much. There's one solid blue stretch in the middle uh, when the Democrats were in the presidency, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and then Harry Truman. So that was five terms or 20 years. If you go back a little further, there's a four presidencies in a row that were Republican from 1896 to 1908. And then there was a two year, two term gap and then Republican presidents again for another three terms. And that the middle blue band I'll talk about later, but it could have easily been Republican. It's just that the Republicans were getting 
I think, so successful that they started competing against themselves and that allowed a Democrat to get into the White House. And this graph shows, this is basically what it shows. It shows that when you look at the popular vote, and I'll show a graph later on that shows the electoral vote, but when you show the popular vote, it shows that there's never really been that huge a gap between the winner and the loser. Nobody has ever gotten more than 62% of the popular vote. And those that did, they might surprise you. But there's a conception that sometimes a victory is an overwhelming victory, but they might be talking about the electoral college. But when it comes to the popular vote, no one is running away getting 80%, 90% of the vote. It just hasn't happened. Because in the United States, the people are pretty split than they have been ever since the, before the Civil War, during the Civil War, and since. There's just two divisions of opinion, if you will, and rarely has the country all gotten behind one candidate who is the overwhelming favorite. So you'll see from this chart that also there's uh, another line along the bottom that shows various third party candidates who have run. I mentioned earlier about how the Republicans started to be su successful so that to the point where they, they started to have two candidates instead of just one. And that was uh, when Teddy Roosevelt wanted to run again after being out of office. And he was a Republican and he ran against someone from his own party, William Howard Taft. At the same time, he was running against the Democrat, Woodrow Wilson. And by splitting the Republican vote, that allowed Woodrow Wilson to earn the presidency. And then throughout time, it hasn't happened in the last 20 years or so, but previously there have been third party candidates that have run and that has affected who has won the overall election. So. Having just looked at that chart, one of the candidates, one of the presidents who is viewed as one of the people in the low end of the spectrum, even viewed as by some uh, historians as the worst president that there's been, is Warren Harding, who was elected in 1920 with 62% of the popular vote, and he won 74% of the Electoral College. So he got off to a great start, but he didn't live up to the expectations, and he actually died in office and then was replaced by his vice president, Calvin Coolidge. Another president that is often the poster child of the Great Depression was Herbert Hoover, who won in 1928 a year before the stock market crashed in 1929, but he also got a resounding 58% of the popular vote and won 84% of the Electoral College. And then the Great Depression started after the stock market crash, and he ran for re-election against Franklin Delano Roosevelt the first time FDR ran for president, and people really wanted to change and were not happy with four years that Herbert Hoover was in office. So the second time he ran, he only got 40% of the popular vote and only 11% of the electoral college. And then finally, another president you just would not expect to have been really popular at the polls, given his uh, place in history, is Richard Nixon. In 1972, when he was re-elected for a second term, he got 61% of the popular vote and he won all but 3% of the Electoral College. And even then, it was predicted that he would win by a healthy margin. He got off, country was happy with the fact that he was pulling the United States out of Vietnam and getting us out of the Vietnam War. And everything was clicking, but he still felt the need to have people break into the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. to get whatever kind of intelligence they could get on his opponent, George McGovern. And then they were caught and it all backfired. And then he was impeached and resigned from office. So those three presidents you wouldn't expect. Then there's other presidents that are very popular. I showed John Kennedy at the start, but he barely got into office in 1960. It was really a 50-50 split in the popular vote. 
and JFK won the Electoral College over Richard Nixon by a healthy amount. And then another president that everybody thought was so popular and should be lionized as one of our greatest presidents, Ronald Reagan, he barely got into office when he won the first time over a very unpopular president, Jimmy Carter, in 1980. Ronald Reagan only got 51% of the popular vote. He got more the second time when he ran for re-election, but the first time he just got 51% of the vote. And that year, there was also a third party candidate, John Anderson, who was a Republican, but felt like he wanted to be a more progressive alternative, sort of like Teddy Roosevelt. And he got 7% of the vote. And he actually might have taken votes away from the Democratic candidate, Jimmy Carter, because he was closer to him ideologically than he was to Ronald Reagan. And then Bill Clinton, another popular president, the most in the popular vote he ever got was 50%. And the first time he ran, he only got 43% of the popular vote. But again, he was helped by a uh, third party candidate, Ross Perot, who was an independent. Bill Clinton was from Arkansas, Ross Perot was from Texas next door. And maybe, I don't know if he ever was officially a Republican, but he seemed to be uh, more conservative. If he was gonna pick a party, he would have been a Republican. And it's felt that he took votes away from the Republicans that ran against Bill Clinton with George Bush Sr. when he was running for re-election and Bob Dole. And finally, Barack Obama, who's viewed as a popular president, both within the U.S. and internationally, he only won with 53% in 2008 and unrespectable, but you thought it maybe could have been higher. But what's actually surprising is that when he ran for re-election, after a fairly successful first four years, he only got 51% of the vote in 2012. So sometimes it's a matter of luck, who wins? I mean, you can work as hard as you can and, and campaign hard, but sometimes it just comes down to fate as to who gets in to the Oval Office. So in focusing on presidents who lived in New York City, came up with 10, 10 presidents and candidates who ran for office. So most of these people did not win, but they're still fairly well known, although some of their names have drifted to the small type in historical annals. But I'd like to just highlight them and later on I'll be showing different places where they lived in New York. So the first one is Horace Greeley and came from New England and also Pennsylvania, moved to New York and he founded and owned a newspaper called the New York Tribune, which stayed in existence in one name or another until fairly recently, but it's not a household name anymore. But he's also known for the expression, go west, young man, which he either coined himself or he repeated something that he heard. The next candidate was Samuel Tilden, four years later in 1876. He came from upstate New York, moved to New York, became a successful lawyer, and also he was a governor of New York for two years, and he lost and died not too many years after he ran. Another common theme is Chester Arthur, four years later than Samuel Tilden. He was on the ticket that won. He was the vice presidential candidate under James Garfield, and he came from upstate New York, moved to New York to make money. He made a lot of money working as a, not as a lawyer, but as a tariff collector for the U.S. Customs Service. And due to things that they did back in the day, he brought in more than the modern day equivalent of a million dollars per year in a government job, which would be totally unacceptable today. But he worked behind the scenes for the Republican Party, and he became the head of the New York State Republican Party for three years. Even while he had become the vice president of the U.S., he still was the head of the New York State Republican Party. But he had never been elected to public office himself, and he served the remainder of the term. He took over for James Garfield after James Garfield died, and he wasn't that popular, and his party did not want to nominate him for re-election. And even if they had, he wouldn't have lived for the whole next term. He died like a year or two after he left office. 
The fourth president is Grover Cleveland. Another, he was born in the New York area. He was born in Caldwell, New Jersey, but he spent his childhood growing up in upstate New York, and then he moved to Buffalo, where he got started to become a lawyer, and he did very well up in Buffalo. And then he was appointed, or maybe he was voted in as the sheriff of Erie County, where Buffalo is, for three years. And he, too, made a lot of money that you wouldn't make these days, but he made the modern-day equivalent of $300,000 a year just being the sheriff of Erie County. And then he became mayor of Buffalo. And I think he took a pay cut each each of these jobs. And then he became the governor of New York for two years. And then he was nominated and won the election to the presidency. So he moved down to DC, got married in the White House. Talk a little bit that, about that a little more later and also I have a whole video about Grover Cleveland that you could watch. And due to things that happened in Buffalo, he wasn't viewed as being very popular in his hometown. So after he lost re-election, he and his wife and kids moved up to New York City and they lived in New York City for four years. And then he ran again to get back into the presidency and he won the third time he ran. So they moved back down to Washington, D.C. Uh, the next president is Teddy Roosevelt. Now, he's the only president of all the 48, 44 presidents that we've had so far that has been born and raised in New York City. And he brought up in a wealthy family. He became a governor of New York, another governor of New York for two years. And then he was the vice presidential running mate to William McKinley, who was running for re-election. And then not too long after William McKinley was assassinated, so Teddy Roosevelt moved up from the vice presidency to the presidency. And then he was re-elected in 1904. And then, as I talked about earlier, he ran for re-election eight years later in 1912 when he did not win. And he died on the fairly young side at age 60. The next New Yorker, Charles Evans Hughes, Another person who came from upstate New York, moved to New York City. Why? To become a successful lawyer, which he did. He was brilliant. He went to Columbia Law School. He graduated number one in his class. Everywhere he went, he was number one. Uh, really sharp guy. He was a governor of New York for four years. He was also unusually, he was uh, on the Supreme Court, not just once, but twice first time he was an associate justice on the Supreme Court and he ran for the presidency while being on the Supreme Court. He actually had to step down in order to run, but then uh, later on he was appointed, or he did not win, he was appointed back on the Supreme Court, which he was the chief justice of for many years, and he was also a secretary of state. So he was one of the candidates and presidents who lived a fairly long life. He lived till he was 86. Al Smith was the candidate in 1928, and uh, I'll show you where he lived a little later on. He was born in, from New York, born and bred, but he never became a lawyer, and he never became the president of the U.S., but he was a governor of New York for six years. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a lot of people think that he might have been from New York City. He never actually lived in New York except for when he went to Columbia Law School, where he did not graduate, but he was a former governor of New York, and then he ascended to the presidency and served longer than any U.S. president. And after he was in office for 12, 13 years, they changed the law that you can't be president more than eight years. And then uh, and he died at age 63. Wendell Wilkie ran against FDR in 1940, the second time FDR ran for re-election, he came from Indiana, moved to New York to become a successful lawyer, which he did. He never became governor of New York, though. That was one of the differences about him with some of the others. He lost to FDR, but he died soon after the election at the young age of 52. He had multiple heart attacks. And then Thomas Dewey ran in 1944 and 48 as the Republican candidate first against FDR and then against Harry Truman. And he came from Michigan to New York, became a successful lawyer, became governor of New York, 
for 12 years, which he was while he ran for the presidency both times. And he lived a fair amount after he had run for office, but he still was only 68 when he passed away. So the first president I'll show you where he lived and talk a little bit more about was Horace Greeley, who was, as I mentioned, the editor of the New York Tribune. And he ran for president in 1872. And he looks different and he was different from most presidents and so in some ways good and in some ways really not good. So he was married to Mary and they had seven children and only two of them lived to adulthood. The other five died during early childhood. And from what I've read, at least several died of neglect. So I think that's horrific that A, it would happen to any household or B, that it would happen to someone who was nominated by a major political party to become the president of the United States. Needless to say, they did not have a happy marriage. He was often absent, didn't seem to care about the kids, you know, he was out of the house. And then also his wife, Mary, also reportedly suffered from mental instability. I think they both did. And uh, the other thing that is note is that she passed away a week before the election. She had been sick for 10 years or so, at least, of tuberculosis, and then she passed away the week before the election. And Horace Greeley, I think he suspended his campaigning to be with her towards the end of the campaign and the end of her life. But from what I've read, I'm not so sure that you know, it was all heartfelt that he was at her bedside. He might have even been hoping for the sympathy vote to help him get into office. But he was running against U.S. Grant, who was popular and unpopular at the same time. But the results of the election were an overwhelming victory for Ulysses S. Grant. And Horace Greeley died 24 days after the election. And in those days, they were still counting the electoral votes, getting the results from some of the farther away states, and it still hadn't all been officially tabulated. He probably knew that he lost, and that might have hit him hard, but he checked himself into a uh, sanitarium for mentally ill people up in Pleasantville, where he also had a, an estate, and he died in that sanitarium at age 61. So within the span of a month, he and his wife both passed away. And so you see here on the right is a artist rendering or facsimile of a picture of what his house looked like back in the 1870s. And let's look at it today. Horace Greeley, who was the editor of the New York Tribune and ran for president in 1872, he lost by a lot to uh, Ulysses S. Grant voting for re-election. But he lived in this four-story former brownstone. It's now kind of a derelict uh, commercial space that's still here at 35 East 19th Street, just west of Park Avenue South. Now we're going to switch back to looking at the electoral vote percentages and you see wider swings on, on this chart. Whereas before with the popular vote, no candidate earned more than 62% of the popular vote. You can see here in a lot of cases, sometimes the candidates won nearly all of the electoral votes because they had the majority of votes in each of the states so they might have narrowly beat out another candidate, but they did it across most states. Nobody's won 100% of the electoral vote, but some have come pretty close, like 97%. So you see some of the big winners in the electoral vote, Woodrow Wilson, FDR, and LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, all won handily. In each of their cases, it was when they were being re-elected, they were already in office. So that's a common theme. And as you can also see, there's 
some close elections that there have been. Most recently, election between George Bush and Al Gore in 2000, a long drawn out affair at the end. And finally, it was ruled that George Bush won Florida. So he won the overall election. And even though Al Gore had a higher percentage of the popular vote, he still lost in the Electoral College. But no one came as close. Al Gore came very close, but no one came as close as him as way back in 1876, back on the left side of the chart, Samuel Tilden lost to Rutherford B. Hayes by one electoral vote. And in his situation, too, he got the majority of the popular vote. He got like 51 percent to Hayes, 48 percent, but he lost by one electoral vote. And let me just show you who we're talking about, Samuel Tilden. He was a successful New York lawyer and very wealthy, and he had a house in the city, and he also had an estate in the country that he'd go to. And he also was governor, I think, for just two years. So he was one of the New York governors that ran. Most of the time, even though you were governor of New York, you'd People did not win the election, but Samuel Tilden came as close as you could come. And he only ran the one time. He was thought of as going to be the candidate in 1880, but he always sort of threw out there that he felt like he had uh, health issues, which I, I've never read what those issues were. But if he had run, he would have been able to serve a whole four years, but then he would have died if he had run for re-election. 1884, but he thrown it out there that his health might not hold up, so that's why they didn't nominate him a second time. So let's take a look at his house, which I also feature in another video on the Gramercy Park neighborhood, but we'll take another quick look at it now. This is where Samuel Tilden lived. He was the Democratic presidential candidate in 1876, and we're on Gramercy Park South, also known as 20th Street, and he owned two adjoining townhouses, as well as an estate upstate. He was a very wealthy lawyer and a former governor of New York. So as I mentioned earlier, several of the candidates who won the presidency did not receive a majority of the votes by the public. And it's happened in many cases. So the first case was, as I mentioned, Rutherford B. Hayes only won 48% to Samuel Tilton's 51. And I also, also should add that that race was so close that there were four states at the end that were hotly contested. And I think Samuel Tilton felt he had won all four states but it was ultimately ruled in at least a, several of the states that the votes were artificially held down for the Republican Party, the party of Rutherford B. Hayes, the party of Lincoln, because of black voter intimidation. So it was a very close race, but Samuel Tilton didn't really hold a grudge to the end of his life. He accepted it and moved on partly because I think he thought he was going to run again. Another candidate who ran once, ran twice, ran three times was Grover Cleveland. And he won and then he lost and then he won again. So he's the only president who has served two terms, but non-consecutively. And in each of the cases, Grover did not win 50% of the popular vote. He got as much as 49%. There were usually other political parties back in the uh, 1880s and early 1890s. So in one case, he also had more popular votes than his competitor, in this case, Benjamin Harrison, but he lost in the Electoral College by a pretty decent amount. And then he came back and ran a second time and he beat the person he lost to the first time, Harrison. But he still only got 46% of the vote because there, again, there were other uh, political candidates running, but he did get back in. Then Woodrow Wilson in 1912 
probably get the lowest percentage of any president of the popular vote. He only got 42% of the vote, and the rest of the vote, 58%, was split by two Republican candidates, Taft, who had been in office, and Teddy Roosevelt, who was in office before Taft, and decided he'd run again, only he didn't get the Republican nomination, so he ran on his own line called the Progressive Party line. But Woodrow Wilson got in, but he only had 42% of the vote. Then Richard Nixon, a lot of people feel like he was very successful in his campaigns in the 60s, early 70s, but his first time running against a party in disarray because Robert F. Kennedy had been assassinated during the campaign. So uh, Hubert Humphrey wound up being the candidate and Hubert Humphrey was the sitting vice president, kind of a well-known name, but not terrifically charismatic. And you just sort of, looking back at history, you would have thought Richard Nixon had won by much more, but he only got 44% of the vote, Humphrey's 43%. And then George Wallace, who was also a Democrat from Alabama, he got 13%. So he might have taken some votes away from Humphrey, but he, he was on the conservative side, so he could have also taken votes from Richard Nixon. Then Bill Clinton only got 43% of the vote in 1992. He was also helped by a third party candidate. In this case, Ross Perot got 19%. And Ross Perot was on the conservative side also, and he probably took more votes away from George Bush Sr. than who was the sitting president at the time. Then George Bush Sr.'s son, George Bush Jr., he, as I mentioned earlier, he won with only 48% of the vote. Al Gore had more popular votes. The reason it's not 100% is there was a third party candidate, again, Ralph Nader, again, who might have taken votes away from Al Gore, but Al Gore didn't help his own cause. He lost his own state, his home state of Tennessee. So if he had won his own home state, he would have been the president. And then finally, uh, Donald Trump in 2016, sort of, it's fresh in everybody's memory, he got less popular votes than Hillary Clinton, who got 51%, got a majority of the popular votes, but beat her pretty handily in the electoral college. So let's switch back to one uh, another one of the New York candidates who ran for office, and that would be Winfield Scott Hancock. Now you might say, well, he was kind of a federal type person. He is from Pennsylvania originally, but he, where he lived in New York was on Governor's Island in the middle of New York Harbor, and he was in charge of the whole Eastern US military from his headquarters there on Governor's Island. But technically he's a New Yorker. He ran for office in 1880, and he wound up losing to another, they were, he was a Civil War hero, and he lost to another Civil War hero candidate, James Garfield. And let me show you where his house was in New York. Let me just show you another picture of Winfield Scott Hancock, another candidate who would have lived throughout his term, but if he had run for re-election, he wouldn't have made it. And you see a campaign poster for the election. Uh, he ran with a man named English, probably a governor, of Indiana. Indiana's produced more vice presidential candidates, including the current vice president, Vice President Pence, who was from Indiana. And there's also a picture here of his wife, Elmira. This is Governor's Island where Winfield Scott Hancock lived. He was a general in charge of the U.S. military on the eastern seaboard, and he was stationed here on uh, this island that was a military-only outpost in the 1880s. So he ran as a Democratic nominee in 1880. He lost to James Garfield, who then was assassinated the next year, and Chester Arthur was the vice president, and he moved up to president. Chester Arthur was also from New York. And then um, after the next four years, uh, Winfield Scott Hancock would have 
live for the four-year term, but he wouldn't have made it to another term. He died in 1886 of complications related to diabetes. And here are some ferries, one headed for Manhattan on the right and the other larger one going to Staten Island. Island and New York Harbor and there's still uh, residential structures from the 1800s on the island and then panning over to the Brooklyn side you can see the one tower of the Verrazano Bridge and then looking back here at sunset in late November of 2020 standing on looking towards Manhattan. So Winfield Scott Hancock, another New York area candidate in 1880. The next president or presidential candidate from New York was Chester Arthur and he was actually the vice president and he took over for uh, James Garfield, who was the president who was assassinated. And James Garfield was shot and was convalescing for several months. And Chester Arthur didn't feel like he should assume that he could be acting in a presidential way at all while James Garfield was still alive. So he went back to his house in New York City and just stayed there. He didn't stay in Washington, D.C. And he also, when he went back home, his wife was no longer living. She had died earlier at the young age of 42 of pneumonia. So he just had his son and young daughter at home with him and they went with him to the White House. So here's a campaign banner from 1880 when he ran. This is the, the ticket that ran against Winfield Scott Hancock and English from Indiana. And so the, this was the winning ticket. And this shows a picture of his house on Lexington Avenue in the East 20s of Manhattan. It's renowned for being where Chester Arthur took the oath of office to be the president. He was sworn in and the word came that James Garfield had passed away. So Chester Arthur was at home and was sworn in in his home. And so you see the picture of the way the house looked back in the 1880s. We're going to show it to you what it looks like today. Chester Arthur had his own piece of tragedy. His wife, who was 42 years old, died of pneumonia. The year that he ran for vice president, he was asked to be the vice presidential candidate after his wife passed away, so his heart must not have been in it. But he took his teenage son and his eight or nine year old daughter to the White House with him. The next president who lived in New York before he went back to Washington, D.C. was Grover Cleveland in the late 1880s, and he served as president until 1892 at the end of his second term. And I've done a whole separate video on him. I discovered his birthplace in Caldwell, New Jersey. He was primarily raised in upstate New York, and then he moved and started his career in Buffalo, where he became a successful lawyer, and then became the sheriff of Erie County, and then became mayor of Buffalo and governor of New York, and then he was nominated to be president and won the first time he ran. And as I mentioned earlier, he lost the when he ran for re-election. Then he ran a third time 
against uh, the person he lost to and won the third time. So it's a whole interesting part of history. Uh, this is a candidate I'm not terrifically fond of, but I highly recommend that you watch my other video on Grover Cleveland where I go into more details. I'll just show that he was married to a woman who was much younger than him, and that's a whole interesting story in itself. When they were married, she was only 21, so she became the first lady at age 21. But before he married Frances Folsom in the White House, also it was the only White House wedding of a president, previously he had a relationship with Maria Halpin up in Buffalo, and that's a whole another story. She bore a child out of wedlock, and she claimed that he raped her, and he said things to sully her reputation and uh, to not hold him back. But you have to watch the other video where I go into detail about all that. And also, I show where he lived in New York between his two terms. He moved to New York City between his two terms. He didn't move back to Buffalo for reasons I describe in the other video. But he lived on at 816 Madison Avenue, which is no longer there. It's part of an apartment building, but it's similar housing to the back in the day of the 1880s on that block at Madison Avenue at 68th Street on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. In going over the list of presidents, I realized I'd missed one, and that's Benjamin Harrison. And he was the president who served between the two terms of Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland was running for re-election and Benjamin Harrison narrowly defeated him in a very contested election. I think there was allegations of voter fraud and Grover Cleveland had more popular votes than Benjamin Harrison squeaked it out on the electoral vote side. In 1893, there was a rematch between the two and then Grover Cleveland won the rematch. And now, skipping over a few presidents who were not from New York, we come to Teddy Roosevelt, who was born and raised in New York City. He was the only presidential candidate who, who won election or, or actually served as president, um, who was born and raised in New York. Another candidate that I'll talk about a little bit later is Al Smith, who was also born and raised in New York, but he did not win election. So Teddy Roosevelt was the vice president under William McKinley, who was another candidate who was assassinated. And then Teddy Roosevelt took over for the rest of that term. And then he was reelected to his own term. So he served for a good length of time as president in the early 1900s. And I'm going to show you his house in a minute in um, the East 20s of Manhattan. Actually, it's on the same street that Samuel Tilden lived on. So where Teddy Roosevelt grew up is a little bit west of where Samuel Tilden's house was in Gramercy Park. So it's a, kind of a power street. You don't think of uh, the 20th Street as being famous for anything, but actually two presidential people lived on that street. And I've read a whole book on Teddy Roosevelt, I think it was called Mornings on Horseback. And it's very interesting. It, it paints his father in a very good light. And I was very impressed to read about his father and the lengths that his father also would go to to work with his son, Theodore, who had very bad asthma as a child. And he would take him for midnight rides in the carriage in Central Park just to get him some fresh air because back then they didn't have inhalers and things like that to combat asthma. And that's one of the reasons that Teddy Roosevelt really took to being a real outdoors person was just because he needed the fresh air to help fight off his asthma. So that was very laudable. Um, one of the things I did not reading about uh, Teddy Roosevelt was he came from privilege. And at one point he wanted to be like a pretend cowboy, but he had all Brooks Brothers type cowboy clothes on out on the range in the Dakotas somewhere. And he was with real cowboys and they were actually rustling cattle and you know, herding them and everything. And there would be 
he would develop a natural camaraderie from doing such a thing. And he was in his late 20s at the time. And so they were sitting around the campfire and one of them, one of the cowboys referred, you know, said something to him as like, like, hey, Teddy, what do you think about this? Or, hey, Theodore. And he corrected him. He stopped everything and he said, no, I only want to be referred to as Mr. Roosevelt. So I thought that was a little uh, high on your horse, so to speak. But he did a lot of good things in the early 1900s. So let's take a look at his house now. This is Teddy Roosevelt's birthplace on East 20th Street, 28 East 20th. It's actually on the same block as uh, Horace Greeley's house. Horace Greeley lived on 19th Street. This is 20th Street. And between Broadway and Park Avenue South, uh, Horace Greeley lived there where he lived much earlier and Teddy Roosevelt came later. But this is where Teddy was born and raised. I heard he didn't like the name Teddy either, but I just can't call him Theodore. So, this house supposedly um, had been knocked down and then it was rebuilt to look like it originally did, if you can imagine that, so that this would be a National Historic Site. Teddy Roosevelt. The next presidential candidate with New York connections was Charles Evans Hughes, who ran as the Republican candidate in 1916. And as I mentioned earlier, if he had won the state of California, which he lost by a very small amount, he would have become president because he would have had the most electoral votes against Woodrow Wilson. But Charles Evans Hughes was unique for various things. One of them is that he was the only sitting member of the Supreme Court to run as a political candidate. So he resigned from the Supreme Court and then ran for president. And after he didn't win, he didn't disappear. He was involved with helping out uh, as an advisor. I can't remember whether he was also a secretary, a cabinet secretary on a later president like uh, Calvin Coolidge, but he, he was helping out and he was also appointed to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So he went back to the Supreme Court. And so that was one of the unique things about him. He was also, one of the things that wasn't unique was that he was the son of a preacher. Some, several of the candidates and presidents, their fathers were preachers. Uh, Grover Cleveland was another one. And so anyway, he was the only candidate, uh, to my knowledge, that lived on the Upper West Side. And I was trying to find out where he lived. And I contacted the New York City Historical Society and another government agency, the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and could not find out. But one of them finally determined that the houses that he lived in, he lived in two houses on West End Avenue, townhouse type houses, both been knocked down and replaced by apartment buildings. So there's nothing to see there now. But the first one was around West 75th Street, and then the next one was further up around 88th Street. And so he lived there. He was also a governor of New York, among his many things. And the other thing I thought was interesting about him, he's the, the last presidential candidate from either party to rock a mustache and beard. Everybody else starting in the late 1800s is pretty much clean shaven. Well, Teddy Roosevelt, I guess, had a mustache, but Charles Evans Hughes was still going for the beard and kept it right through the time that he was on the Supreme Court both times. And so that he that lended him a uh, distinguished look. I think he would have been a good looking guy without a beard, but that was his own personal taste. Al Smith, who was born and raised in New York, and ran for president in 1928, lost to Herbert Hoover, was another former New York State governor who served for, I believe, 12 years. And where he grew up was a very interesting location. And let's look at it now. Al Smith was the Democratic presidential candidate in 1928. He lost to Herbert Hoover 
right before the Great Depression, the stock market crash of 1929. And where he was born and grew up was right beneath the eastern or the western terminus of the Brooklyn Bridge, which we're standing on now. And Google Maps puts his address, 170 South Street, as directly underneath the bridge. So it's no longer there. But just to give you an idea of the type of neighborhood that Al Smith grew up in, it looked like this. This is the South Street seaport area in Lower Manhattan. And uh, Al said he grew up with the bridge. He was born in 1873, and the bridge, Brooklyn Bridge opened in 1883 when he was 10 years old, so it was well under construction his entire childhood. And uh, this is where he grew up, and later became governor of New York for like 12 years. Wendell Wilkie was another presidential candidate who came from another part of the country and settled in New York to become a successful lawyer, and by all accounts, he was. And he ran and lost to FDR in 1940. I think it was the th second time that FDR ran for re-election, and FDR by then was it was right on the cusp of World War II, and FDR had helped bring the country back from the Depression throughout the 1930s, so he was highly thought of. And Wendell Wilkie was actually a Democrat who, I guess, agreed to run on the Republican ticket, but I, from what I think I read, he was on good terms with FDR, and it was an amicable campaign, and he was a young candidate. He was 48 years old when he ran. One thing that's interesting, though, is if he had won, he would not have lived during his full term in office because he wound up, he died young. And at age 52, he had multiple heart attacks. He was a heavy smoker, and so he had his health problems, and he would not have made it through the next term in office. I'm not quite sure where he lived in New York City. One of the things, too, about him is supposedly he had a long-term affair with another woman. And But back in the 1940s and in the earlier days, it didn't seem to come up ever as a, a campaign issue. Thomas Dewey was another former New York governor. Actually, he was New York governor while he ran for president two times, in 1944 against FDR, the last time FDR ran and in 1948 against Harry Truman, who was the sitting president who had taken over after being vice president, and he moved up to president when FDR passed away. And for whatever reason, Thomas Dewey was viewed as the favorite, and when Harry Truman won re-election, it was regarded as the biggest upset in U.S. political history. Not sure if it really was that much of an upset, but that's the way historians paint it. But Thomas Dewey's from Michigan originally, moved to New York. It's another similar story. Became a very successful lawyer and became a governor of New York for 12 years. So he had an estate upstate in Pauling, New York. And he also, when he was in New York City, uh, either while he was a regular private attorney or when he was in New York on business as the governor of New York, he didn't have a place, a regular place to live. He lived on the 15th floor of the Roosevelt Hotel, and I'll show that to you now. The Roosevelt Hotel is where Thomas Dewey lived and worked while he was governor of New York during the week when he was in New York City. Um, he had an estate upstate in uh, Pauling. Then he'd also spent time in Albany too. But uh, he lived at a hotel for a lot of the time and also when he was uh, a private attorney before he was in elected office. So, and this hotel right now is closed during the pandemic.
This is right on Madison at 46th Street in Midtown Manhattan. John F. Kennedy, who happens to be my personal favorite American president, many people associate his family from Boston area, and he was a senator from Massachusetts before he became president. Many people don't realize that he actually spent most of his childhood growing up in New York City and in Westchester County, just north of New York. So his family moved down from Boston, from the Boston area, Brookline, because his father wanted to be closer to Wall Street, and they actually lived in a house It still exists in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. They lived there for a couple of years, and then they moved to a bigger house. They had a large family with nine kids, I believe. They moved up to Bronxville, New York, which is just south of Scarsdale, and it's very well-off community with beautiful big homes. But the house that they lived in is no longer there. It was knocked down and they've built newer homes since then in that location. But it's just interesting that you don't associate JFK with being from New York City. But actually, after he was assassinated, Jackie Kennedy moved up to New York from Washington, D.C. with two children, Caroline and John Jr. And they live on Fifth Avenue on the Upper East Side for many years. And then John Jr. moved. Uh, when he got married, he lived in uh, Tribeca. Now, Barack Obama, most people associate with Chicago or Hawaii, but he did graduate from Columbia University in New York, and he lived in New York for a couple of years before moving to Chicago. And in doing some research, looking up where he lived in New York. Naturally, the New York Times focuses on a place, I think, on the Upper East Side uh, where he lived in Manhattan. And uh, later on, he also lived in the Hell's Kitchen section of Manhattan. But I once caught my eye, saw an article about the time he lived for several months in Park Slope in Brooklyn, New York. And we're going to take a look at that neighborhood and house now. We're on Prospect Park West, looking north, and we're looking for Barack Obama's temporary residence here in Park Slope, Brooklyn, which should be right down the street here on a beautiful brownstone block. I'll let you know when we get there. Okay, not too far down the block. It was this building at 640 2nd Street. And he, they lived on the top floor. And he had a girlfriend from Australia for about a year. And she moved in and um, he moved in with her for a little while and then uh, they both moved out. And she, he helped her move to another location in Brooklyn closer into the city and he moved to Hell's Kitchen. And his girlfriend from Australia was three years older. It was like his first year out of college after he graduated from Columbia and he I think it was between jobs and so he uh, hung out here for like three four months moving in in December and they moved out in March so this is looking down the street down the slope of Park Slope Brooklyn on a beautiful November day November 20th 2020 history. I've heard that the people who lived here and the neighbors, they didn't even know that this had some historical significance to it. 640 2nd Street in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And of course, Donald Trump. You know he's from New York. He was born in Queens and he made his name in real estate in Manhattan and one of his primary residences, if not his main private residence, 
is in the Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. This is Donald Trump's building in Midtown Manhattan on Fifth Avenue at 56th Street. And during normal times, you can go inside and they have waterfalls and everything in the lobby. It's actually interesting and pretty. But Fifth Avenue and Midtown these days is really on the quiet side. It's what really stands out is there's a lot of construction work going on and that seems to be the main activity, not too many office workers. So the Trump Plaza, Trump Tower here in Midtown Manhattan. Finally, I just wanted to talk briefly about several candidates and sitting presidents who would not have lived till the end of the term if they had been elected. So I mentioned earlier on about Horace Greeley and also Samuel Tilden and also Chester Arthur. Chester Arthur, one of the things he was dealing with is he had Bright's disease, which is like a disease of the kidneys. And he suffered with that while he was president, maybe even before he was president. And, you know, back then they didn't have the medicine that they have today. And he, he, did, he would do things like go to Florida, try to feel better, and he wound up feeling worse. And then another time he went to Yellowstone National Park with a group of senior federal officers and felt better. But you would do things like holistically to, to feel better. But it finally caught up with him and he died within two years of when he left the presidency in 1886 at only the age of 57. And his young daughter was still only 14 years old and she had by then lost both parents. So she was raised by an aunt from there on. Calvin Coolidge took over as vice president after the then president Warren G. Harding died of a heart attack while in office. So Calvin Coolidge took over and then he was reelected in 1924. He could have run again. There was no law against it. They didn't come up with that law until after FDR had been in office forever, going on his fourth term. So they decided to limit it to just two four-year terms that you could serve as president. Anyway, he declined to run again. He was kind of tired out or whatever from being the president. He was kind of a retiring guy to begin with. They called him Silent Cal. And he died of a heart attack, I think, in his sleep, only at the age of 60, which would have been two months before the next inauguration day if he was still in office. So one thing that also maybe contributed to him not living long was that uh, while they lived in the White House, his one son was playing tennis. And this is back in 1924. And he was playing tennis, but he was playing without socks and just wearing his tennis shoes. And he got a blister. And from that, if you can believe it, he got blood poisoning or sepsis and he died from that. So he was only 16 years old. And you can imagine how that affected Calvin and his wife while they're in the White House. And I'm sure it took a lot of the air out of the tires for him to want to continue being president. He probably had bad associations with the White House and he blamed himself. So he would not have made it to serve a full another term. And Wendell Wilkie, as I mentioned earlier, he died of multiple heart attacks, like separately, and then all a cluster of heart attacks right at the very end when he died in New York Hospital in 1944. And finally, Lyndon Johnson, who looked a lot older than he actually was. He died at age 64, but being president and also being a heavy smoker and maybe heavy drinker too, it all aged him. And he died three days after inauguration day of the term following when he left office. So if he had run again, and there was, in 1968, it was assumed he would run for re-election, but he withdrew his name from consideration and said he would not accept the nomination if he was nominated. But a lot of people were glad to see him go. 
and he had had a heart attack earlier in his life and then after he left office in 69 after inauguration day he had constant chest pains he had another heart attack and then he finally had a third heart attack in 1973 so he died at the age of 64. so that's a wrap-up of all the presidents some overall interesting history and tidbits and then a focus on the presidents and the presidential candidates who lived in New York City. So thank you for watching.